Good morning. Hope that you're all doing well. Go ahead and have a seat there, please, if you do that. And let's take our Bibles this morning and open to Genesis chapter 28, beginning in verse 1. What a glorious weekend. It's great to be in the house of the Lord. It's great to worship. It's great to have God's Word speak to us. The title of our message is Transformation in Heaven's Gate. So let's pray and ask God's blessing. Father, thank you so much. Because we love your word, we know that you send it in power and that you use the Holy Spirit to apply it to our lives. And so God, this morning, we just open our heart to receive from you and pray that by the Spirit, you would stir us up and show us the desire of your heart for us. We ask that now in Jesus' name, amen. Genesis 28 is a lesson of transformation, and the story focuses on Jacob. We've been studying through I, uh, Abraham and his son Isaac, and Isaac married Rebekah, sovereign hand of God, through all of that is revealed, and though she gets then pregnant and she has twins. So it tells us that inside of her womb, the, the twins are like struggling and wrestling, and so she inquires of the Lord, what is happening here? And the Lord gives her this word that there are two nations within her and that the older would serve the younger. So in other words, that blessing of Abraham would be handed to Isaac and then would be given to the younger one, who was Jacob. So when Jacob was born, as he came forth, uh, he actually had a hold of his uh, older brother's heel, Esau. And so you can just imagine the scene. Oh, look at that. That is so cute. Look at the little baby. He's got a hold of his brother's heel. What shall we call him? I know what let's do. That is so cute. Let's call him heel snatcher, which means supplanter. In other words, one who trips other people up by catching them on the heel. That is so cute. What a cute name for a boy. Yeah, until he grows up. And then he starts living up to that name of catching people by the heel, living by that kind of life. And we saw the story, we were seeing it last week, where when the boys grew up, and Esau, the older one, uh, you know, he's an outdoorsman, he's a skilled hunter, he's a man's man, and, and uh, Jacob, it says, uh, he was a peaceful man living in tents. In other words, he was a mama's boy. And uh, one day, when Esau came in from the field, he was famished, and Jacob had made a red lentil stew. And uh, so Esau sees this and smells this stew, you know, and he says, give me some of that red stew there, I'm famished. And so Jacob, seeing an opportunity to do some heel snatching, says to him, sell me your birthright first. Birthright? For a bowl of stew? Really? But now, you see, it's Esau's bad here, too, because he didn't value his birthright. And so he sold it far too easily. Really? A birthright for a bowl of stew? But Jacob is taking advantage. He's heel snatching. He's taking advantage of Esau's hunger, and he caught him by the heel, and it took his birthright. Then, later, um, Rebekah overhears Isaac plotting to give the blessing that goes along with that birthright to, I, to Esau, the older one, even though Isaac knew full well that the blessing of Abraham should be given to the younger one. He knew that full well, but he liked Esau. Esau was a man's man, and he would bring home game, and Isaac had a taste for game, and so he plotted to give the blessing to Esau. Well, Rebecca overheard this. And so she hatched a plan by which Jacob would deceive, do a little more heel snatching in order to deceive Isaac into giving the blessing to him. And so uh, he's, he's almost blind. He's so old. And so uh, she puts on uh, uh, like a goat skin on his neck and on his hands because Esau was hairy. And he pretends to be Esau. And so he ends up getting the blessing through deception. Esau, when he finds out about it, is enraged. And he makes it very clear. When our father Isaac has died, I want to kill my brother Isaac, uh, my, my brother Jacob. And so that's where we pick up our story in Genesis 28. So Rebekah, the mother, she knows that Esau intends to kill Jacob. So she uses some of her wifely influence 
to convince Isaac to send Jacob away that he might find a wife amongst her relatives 500 miles away in Haran. A perfectly rational explanation, a great cover for why Jacob now must run for his life. And so how does she use her wifely influence? Well, she adds a little drama, okay, and she says this. She says, I'm going to die if my son, Jacob, takes a, a wife from these Canaanite women here. I, I would rather die than to see that he marry one of these hussies women around here. And so Jacob, he gives in to this pressure. And that's where we pick it up in, G in Genesis 28, verse 1. Let's read it. So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him. And he charged him and he said, Now you will not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Help me out here. And you go, arise, go to Padanaram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father. And from there you are to take to yourself a wife from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. Now, if you know anything about Laban, okay, Laban is quite the manipulator himself. And some people see a little poetic justice coming here as he's sending him to Laban. Then he adds this amazing blessing. He's giving him that blessing from Abraham to Isaac and now to Jacob. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may become a company of peoples. May he also give you the blessing of Abraham to you and to your descendants with you that you may possess this land the land of your sojournings, which God gave to Abraham. We know it today as Israel. That blessing passed down to generation to generation and resides on Israel today. Then Isaac sent Jacob away and he went to Badan Oram, to the area, to Laban, son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. Jump down to verse 10, if you would. Then Jacob departed from Beersheba, which is where they were living, Beersheba is in the, the south poor, uh, part of Israel, uh, kind of toward the Mediterranean, although it's still deserty there. And he departed for Haran, more than 500 mile journey. And he came to a certain place and he spent the night there because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it under his head and he lay down in that place. Most people would not use a stone, but he found a stone and needed something to lay his head on. So he did this. And then it says he had a dream. This dream is so amazing. God is going to speak to him and it's so vivid, so real. He had this dream. And behold, there was a ladder that was set, uh, or stairs you might say, that was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and behold, angels of God are ascending and descending on it. This is the famous Jacob's ladder, the stairway to heaven uh, uh, picture that we have. It's so significant because it is actually brought back to us in the New Testament, which we'll look at. It's amazing. And then, behold, the Lord stood above it, and he said, I am Jehovah. I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the land on which you lie, I will give it to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and the east and the north and the south. And in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And we are recipients of that because he's referring there to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. We receive that blessing through Jesus. And behold, verse 15 is so key. These promises are promises that he speaks to Jacob, but that we can see also apply to our lives. He said, behold, I'm with you, and I will keep you wherever you go. And I'll bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. I just love that great statement of promise. I will not leave you until I have done what I have said I will do. So then Jacob awoke from his sleep and he said, surely the Lord is in this place. I didn't know it. I did not know it. And he was afraid and he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. 
So Jacob rose early in the morning and he took the stone which he had put under his head and he set it up as a pillar and he poured oil on its top, which is a, 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 a way of designated as an altar place where God's presence resides. And he called the name of that place Bethel, which means house of God. By the way, Bethel, that city that, that is going to grow through this, is mentioned more times in the scripture than almost any other city except for Jerusalem. Jerusalem being the most important city, Bethel is mentioned like second most. And all that's going to unfold here at Bethel is going to be very, very important. So he calls this place Bethel, although it had previously been called Laz or Luz, and it means to be turned aside or, or crooked, actually. Then Jacob made a vow, and he said, if God will be with me, and will keep me on this journey, and will give me food to eat and garments to wear, and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord Jehovah will be my God. And this stone, which I have set up as a pillar, will be God's house. And all that you give to me, I will surely give a tenth to you, O God, as a recognition that you are the God who blesses my life. Now, this is a very, very important chapter, very important verses. And there's so much to apply to our lives because of what's happening in Jacob. And there's so many things that we can see that apply to our lives, starting with this, that running from troubles doesn't work. That's what Jacob is doing. He's running from his troubles. He's on the run. In reality, he's not just on the run from Esau. I suggest to you that he's been on the run from God for a long time. Abraham had a wonderful relationship to the Lord so that he was called the friend of God. Isaac had a relationship to the Lord. He was instructed by God. But as we've read in the scriptures so far, Jacob has never known God for himself. And the results of that are seen in his life. You know, there's an old saying, maybe you've heard it, God has no grandchildren. What does that mean? What it means is that every person must have their own relationship to God. You cannot, you cannot ride on the relationship uh, that your spouse has with God. You cannot ride on the relationship your parents have with God. You must have, each one must have their own personal relationship with God. And so far, Jacob has not encountered God, but God is bringing him to the end of himself. This is such an important thing. We must come to the end of ourselves. Jacob's cunning, his clever little manipulating, his heel snatching, is finally cut up to him. And the consequences of what were in his heart are chasing him, you might say. He's on the run. Can you just mad, imagine now, every relationship in his life is broken. He's left his mother, whom he loves dearly, because of the troubles that he started, he leaves his mother, he has deceived and lied to and deceived his father, and his brother wants to kill him. So in other words, there's conflict and heartbreak all around him. Can you imagine coming to a point in your life, he's well into his adulthood, He's many years into his living as an adult, and everything is broken. Now, there are people who look around, and they realize, all my relationships are broken. And this is such an important thing to understand, that God is bringing him to the end of himself. Jacob could not have felt good about himself when he was deceiving his father. And he was wearing the, the goat skin, the hairy, you know, he did that because his brother was hairy and he's trying to deceive. And he could have felt good about having this blessing given to him through deception. You can be sure the Holy Spirit was convicting his heart. You know why? Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. And if you've ever experienced the convicting of the Holy Spirit, you know that God is on the move and that's a good thing because he's bringing you to the end of yourself. John chapter 16, if I go, when I go, Jesus said, I will send the Holy Spirit to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. That's what he does. And that's a good thing when it brings you to the end of yourself. Many people, I think, are tempted by the idea, the thought of leaving their troubles behind, you know, starting over. I'll just leave it all behind. I'll just start over fresh. And they say to themselves, 
everything's so broken, everything's so messed up, it would just be better to throw in the towel and start over. The problem that I have found with this approach, the problem that I have found with that is this. Wherever you go, there you are. In other words, you take yourself with you wherever you go. And then when you leave, you're actually taking the real problem with you because it starts in the heart. You know, verse 11 says that he came to a, quote, certain place. It wasn't just another place. It was a certain place. It was that place where Jacob was going to come to the end of himself. It was the perfect place. You know, just because times are bad doesn't mean that God isn't doing anything. If God is bringing you to the end of yourself, God is doing something very important. Here's why. Because you can't outrun God. God is already there waiting for you. You can't outrun God. You can be sure that God has been working on Jacob's heart. You can be sure that the Holy Spirit was uh, convicting his heart and trying to get his attention. The problem is Jacob wasn't listening. Jacob, you might say, was hitting ignore on his cell phone. You know, back in the old days, when they made cell phones, cell phones were a great invention. But when they were first made, when they first came out, not only were they big as bricks, but they had a button that said ignore. You can just ignore. And uh, that button always bothered me when my kids got cell phones. And I used to have this speech with my kids. Like, the most important call you're ever going to get is that call that comes from mom or me. You never hit ignore when mom or I call. Any parent here want to say amen to that? That's the most important call of your life. You answer when I call. Now, that's a great illustration. Because if God is trying to get your attention, it would be really good not to ignore it. Because God is trying to get your attention because he is doing a work. He's bringing you to the end of yourself. He wants you to stop running. Stop running. Because when you stop running, you'll have an encounter with God. And when you have an encounter with God, there's going to come a revival. One of the best illustrations has to be Jonah. You know the story of Jonah. God had called this prophet to go to the people of Assyria and Nineveh, the city, and bring a message of repentance and a warning from God to repent. And you know, they would have new hope and new life if they did. But Jonah despised the people of Assyria. In fact, he wanted the wrath of God poured out on him. So he didn't want to bring that word, and he didn't want to do what God asked him to do. So he went down to Joppa, which is a port city there in Israel, and he booked passage on a ship going the opposite direction, towards Tarshish, which is like southern Europe. And guess what happened? They encountered a terrible storm. In other words, time to meet God. And in that encounter with God, he began to see, he began to come to the end of himself. Jonah chapter 2, verses 3 to 4, we see this, that Jonah says, all your breakers, this is Jonah, all your breakers and billers, uh, billows have passed over me. So I said, I have been expelled from your sight, but nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. In other words, I will turn my heart back to you, O oh God. That encounter with God has brought him back. He's brought him back to revival. Soon he's giving thanks to God. Now, another example has got to be Saul in the New Testament. We later know, uh, know him as Paul. And, and so Paul, or rather Saul as we know him, he's, he's persecuting the Christians and he's taking them out of their homes and dragging them, see that, that they be stoned. And at one point he has like orders from the high priest to go up to a city in Damascus and take the Christians from there and bring them back for persecution. And so as he's journeying up there, uh, towards Damascus, he has an encounter with God. Literally, God knocks him off his high horse and blinds him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He says to him, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, that is a great expression. In other words, you are kicking against the goads. You are resisting the Holy Spirit. I have been trying to get your attention all of this time, but you're kicking against the goads. You know what a goad is. Back 
in the days when farmers, you know, would, would move their cattle, they would take a stick and they, they would stick their, their ribs to get the ox to move in the different direction. And the ox didn't like that. They would kick against the goads. That's a picture of people who are resisting God, trying to get their attention and change the direction of their lives. Saul, Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. God is getting his attention. And what comes out of that? Revival. He has an encounter with God, and the end result is revival. I love Acts chapter 9, verse 11. The Lord said to Ananias, get up, go to the street called Straight, inquire at the house of Judas for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. Ah, he is praying. He is having an encounter with God, and he is having revival, because here's the point to it. We all need an encounter with God. We need an encounter with God. Jacob comes to a certain place. He lays down to sleep. God was already there. God was there ready to reveal himself to Jacob. That's what we need. We need to come to the end of ourselves. You know, in business, there's a, a saying that uh, people sometimes use. They, they'll say, well, we need to have a come to Jesus meeting. You know what? People need to have a real come to Jesus meeting. Because when you have a real come to Jesus meeting, you have an encounter with God. And here's what we have to see. We need to see this perspective. You have a come to Jesus meeting, then please know this, that it is his kindness that leads us to repentance. See, God showed Jacob this ladder between earth and heaven and the angels descending uh, or ascending and descending on it. And then he gives to Jacob those blessings that he gave to Abraham and that he gave to Isaac. Through your descendants, all the families of the earth will be blessed. I will be with you and I will watch over you wherever you go. Notice this. Notice that this encounter with God is where God pours out all of this blessing. All of this hope, it's kindness. He doesn't lecture him. He doesn't condemn him. He doesn't rebuke him. He brings him to God. See, I love Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience? Not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. I just love that perspective. It doesn't correct him. He doesn't rebuke him. He doesn't condemn him. He brings him to himself. God knows that we need to change our hearts. It starts with that. But the change of the heart is the change of the desire of the heart. But you've got to be willing to come. You must be willing to change. And you have to be willing to let go of all the hurt. Let go of all the hurt. That's a hard thing for many people to do, to let go of all the hurt. Because I think the problem for some is that they would rather feel badly about themselves. You know why I've come to see that it's a form of self-inflicted punishment and that somehow they believe that they were going to extract justice in their own life by self-inflicted uh, uh, punishment of self-pity. But it prevents the coming to the Lord. It prevents the transformation of the heart. In the old days, I was thinking of an illustration to illustrate that. And I was thinking of the old days. In the old days, when people would take a bath, they would sit in the tub and they would pour water over themselves. But here's the problem with that. You're sitting in your own dirty water. Now, you might wonder how I know this. Yeah, because this is how we took baths. We were very poor when we grew up, and this is how we took baths. And then when we were so poor that when you finished your bath, the next person would get in the tub. I was number five. <laughs> I know. And you know, you pour water over yourself, and you're just like wallowing in self-pity. You know, there is something kind of comforting in self-pity, isn't there? There is something kind of comforting in self-pity. I remember... Many years ago, breaking up with a girlfriend. Okay, actually, she broke up with me. I'm better now. <laughs> but I, I remember just wallowing in the feelings. You know, I would take a long drive. 
I know. Put in my eight track of Engelbert Humperdinck singing feelings, nothing more than feelings. Anybody know this song? Oh, it's a classic for the emotional moments of your life. Trying to forget these feelings of love. You gotta love the chorus. Okay, you gotta love the chorus. Feelings, whoa, 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 whoa. Feelings. I mean, that is deep. <laughs> that is deep right there. Okay, back to our regularly scheduled message. And the, the point is that you gotta let go of the hurts, you gotta let go of the wounds. Because in that come to Jesus meeting, what you're going to see, here's what you're going to see, that God has a wonderful plan for your heart. Here's why I say it that way. Here's why I say it that way. There was, um, many years ago, a pamphlet that came out. It's a famous gospel tract that was called The Four Spiritual Laws. And it was commonly given, you know, when people are, are sharing the gospel. But the first law, so-called spiritual law, was this, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Now the problem is I saw that. The problem as I saw it is that people wanted God's plan for their life more than they wanted God's heart for their life. See, if you want revival, transformation of God is centered on what God is doing in the heart through a personal relationship to himself through Jesus Christ his son. There's where transformation comes. You wanna to come to Jesus meeting, it's a come to Jesus meeting. It's a come to relationship meeting. If I was going to give that spiritual law, if I was to rewrite that pamphlet, I would say God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your heart. Because transformation is the beginning of changing your heart. And then once your heart is changed, then you're going to see your mind is changed. Your perspective is going to change. The truth of who God is in your life will change. Right? Romans chapter 12 verse 2 don't be conformed to this world. Do not let the world shape you and mold you into its way, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God is doing a new work. God is changing you. God is transforming you. He starts with your heart. Then he gives you a new mind. He begins to transform the way you think. Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God's not finished. God is doing a work. That come to Jesus meaning is the beginning of transformation. So Jacob awoke and he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. See, you think you're in a hard place. That place there is just filled with rocks. If you ever go to Israel, you'll know it's a rock filled place. And in many ways, people can relate to it. It's like an analogy. Their lives are filled with rocks. And, and the metaphor might even be, and you know, because you got a rock for a pillow. But you're not alone. God is in that place. You think you're alone, but you're not alone. God is in that place. And you didn't know it. But if you would know it, if you would take hold of that, I tell you, it will transform your faith. It is the very substance, it is the very rock on which faith is built to believe that God is in fact with you wherever you go. Why? Because he loves you. His love for you knows no bounds. If you could just be convinced. You know, I love Psalm 23. It's so beautiful, so poetic, but it's filled with power. One of those verses, verse four. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. And your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That is a key. If we could only grasp that truth. Philippians 1.39, very famous. David writes these verses. You have enclosed me behind and before. You've laid your hand on me. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. And even there, your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. David knew that. David 
understood a key component of faith, to believe that God is with him. You know what's interesting is that Jesus connects himself to that very thing that is unfolding to us here in Genesis 28. That stairway, that ladder that goes between earth and heaven, it's Jesus. He is, in fact, that stairway. Here's what I mean. Back in John 1, Jesus is he's now uh, inviting his disciples to come. Andrew and, and Peter, you know, have come. Um, and then Philip, Philip, you know, he comes to the Lord and then he goes and gets Nathaniel. And he says, you, uh, you must come. We have, we have met him, you know, who is the, the one promised of God, you know, the Messiah from Nazareth. He says, from Nazareth? The famous line, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip says, come and see. Come and see. So as they're coming to Jesus, Jesus sees Nathanael. And he says, ah, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. This is John chapter 1, starting in verse 48. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? How is it that you know me? Jesus answered and said, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, you believe? You will see greater things than these. And then he adds this. Listen to this. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, every Jew knew exactly what he meant by that. You're talking about Jacob's vision, Jacob's dream, Jacob's ladder. You are, in fact, that stairway, that access into heaven? Yes. And you'll see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. What an interesting and amazing connection. And so this place... It's such an amazing declaration because of what it says of Jesus Christ. And so Jacob, he responds. And I love the response because it's sincere worship. And that's right. To respond with sincere worship is right. He rises early. He's filled with awe of God. He sets up an altar. And he calls the place Bethel, house of God. You know, worship is absolutely the right response to what God has done. Because worship... The way God meant worship is a response of the heart. Why should we give God our heart? Why should we give God our heart? Answer, because God gave you his. God gave you his heart. God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. He sent his son, the word of God, the heart of God. I love you. He pursues you. Come away, my beloved, he says. He gives you his heart. What should we give in return? Our heart. Worship is like experiencing heaven. Here's what I mean by that. You know, I'm convinced that God gave us worship, that we might have a a taste. Because you, you read Revelation. And you see all of these amazing descriptions of eternity and heaven and the presence of God. And over and over you read about a new song and the worship of the angels and the power. The music was so powerful that it shook, you know. And and it's this picture of the, the power of the worship and the music of heaven. And I'm convinced that God gave us worship, song, music, that we can have a taste of it. Because I tell you, when, when the Holy Spirit inhabits the praises of his people and the heart of the people are responding with their heart back to God, it is a holy, it is a holy moment. It is a glorious, holy day when you bring your heart in sincere worship in response to all that God has done. And you see Jacob's response. First, he sets up an altar. Here's my heart. Then he looked to God to be with him every step of the way. Here's my life. Then he committed this tithe of all that he had. God, you are the blesser of my life. 
I, I, I want to respond to that. I want to give back to you a portion of all that you've given to me. You know, whenever we receive our tithes and offerings here, we like to make it very clear that it's an aspect of worship. Because what you're saying when you give a, your tithes or offerings, what you're saying is, God, I recognize that you are the blesser of my life. You are the blesser of my life. And I want to give to you a portion of all you've given to me. I love you, God. It's part of worship. When you, he wants your heart. He wants your thanks. He wants your recognition that God is, in fact, the blesser. And then lastly, would you look at chapter 29, just the first verse, because I want to show you something very interesting. It says in chapter 29, verse 1, in the English, it seems so straightforward. Jacob went on his journey, came to the land of the sons of the east. But in the Hebrew, it's a little more descript. It says, oh, Jacob lifted up his heels. I just love that picture. Like, have you ever had an encounter with God? Have you ever had such an experience where God is the one who has just touched your life and he's healed the hurts and the wounds and he's established his name in your life and the end result is you just having a rejoicing in the heart. Jesus said, I'm going to give you a joy. And it's not like the world gives. I'm going to give you a joy that's right out of heaven. And it's like, I love that picture. He lifted up his heels. It's like he's, his step is light. He's going now. He's walking forth with that promise of God. Let's have that same response of believing that God is able. You may be in a very difficult place. Maybe there's rocks all around you. Maybe you have broken relationships and there's hurt all around you. Here's what I'm convinced of. I'm convinced that you have a come to Jesus encounter and he'll heal you. He'll heal your heart. And then you watch. When your heart is healed, God will use you to heal the people around you and your relationships will be healed. And he'll establish his name in your life. And you'll be convinced that God is with you and walking, ordering your way. And there's going to be a joy. There's a joy that's right out of heaven. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. We are convinced that you are the one that has ordered our way. And God, I pray for anyone in this place this morning anyone who feels that there's rocks all around them, they even got a rock for a pillow. God, I pray that everyone in this room would be convinced that you are the one who heals the hurts and the wounds. You're waiting. You're waiting for a come to Jesus meeting. You're waiting for an encounter with the living God. And I just pray for everyone this morning, God, that you would, you would just speak words of life to us, that you would show us your heart after us, that you would pursue us by your Holy Spirit. And church this morning, if you would say, God, I run no more. Here I am. No more running, God. Here I am. You have my heart. You have my life. You have my faith that I believe that you'll be with me. Church, would you say, well, I'm going to ask that you would just raise your hand and in so doing that you would say, no more running. You have my heart. You have my life. Here I am. Would you just raise your hand to the Lord and say that to the Lord this morning. God bless you. God bless you. Many hands raised. You're not alone. Anyone else? God, you have my heart. No more running. You've got my life. You've got my heart. Here I am. Father, we thank you and we honor you for what you're doing this day. And I pray that we would have a response of the heart to recognize that you're the blesser. In Jesus' name, and everyone said...